today the closing seminar will be presented by Levente Klein, who is a research manager at the TJ Watson Research Center of IBM in New York. Um, and he is a researcher specifically on artificial intelligence and geospatial learning. You will remember our second presentations also introduced us to the IBM projects on uh, geospatial um, machine learning. So, as usual, before I give the word to Levente, I would like to remind you that uh, we're going to take breaks during the presentation if there are any questions. So, you have two ways of indicating a question, either by raising your hand on your control panel or by typing a question always in your control panel. And then I will pick them up as we go along in the, in the work. So, I hope you uh, make the most out of this presentation and enjoy it. And thank you, Levente, for joining the series and for giving us your time um, on an early morning in a lockdown in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Uh, so I'm going to present some of the work that uh, we undertake in the last couple of years at uh, IBM Research uh, here in New York. And uh, I'm going to go through multiple technologies that has been developed mainly some of the sensor work and some of the implementations at the system level, how we used uh, sensor networks to preserve water or safe water, and then how we are trying to take some of these informations that you take from individual sensors and then take it down to, let's say, satellite imagery that allow us to image uh, the areas across very, very large geographical regions and then extract information. So just to give you some idea about uh, what we are trying to do is really just an end-to-end -end solutions where we are trying to integrate into some of our platforms informations coming from a variety of sources. And those could be individual sensors that uh, has been generated and they measure various physical parameters. And then we take some of the informations from the sensors and then we are aggregating them into the cloud. And then from once in the cloud, we are trying to distribute the informations to individual users that could be either platforms as a cell phone or it could be just a decision platform information that it's coming to them. So in general, in some of these platforms, you know, there are multiple challenges that we have to overcome. And so some of them, it's really uh, the amount of data. And it's probably heard about it. Uh, in, we are in the big data space and so really, some of the data sets that we are trying to leverage for our applications, they are way too large. And it means that they are so large that trying to transfer them over the internet, it's going to be just almost impossible. So in many of these cases, we just uh, realized that instead of moving the data to some of the analytics that traditionally has been done, where people are acquiring the data, then they download into their uh, laptop, and then they are processing it, we really need to make the transitions from moving the analytics very close to the data. And once we are there, then we can combine a variety of data sets that are available. And as I'm trying to convey the message through these presentations, you would realize that combinations of different data sources are really enriching the information and the decisions that can be taken on these data sets. So just to give you an idea, uh, currently satellite imagery uh, that is generated from a variety of uh, uh, government agencies and also some private enterprises, they are at the level of exascales. Exabytes, it's really something that now uh, start to be really available for most of the people to analyze. Nevertheless, the techniques and the knowledge that we accumulated by analyzing, let's say, gigabytes or potentially even terabytes of data may not scale at this level. So we need to really develop the tools and then the analytics that are able to process these informations in volume and also at the speed that they are generated. And so in general, right, as you're going to see, some of these informations may not be specifically acquired uh, for a certain purpose. Nevertheless, they carry that information that could be used for, for a variety of applications. So in general, there are a couple of uh, directions in which we are trying to leverage the information that is corrected. Uh, usually we are trying to address specific industries and within IBM, we have currently two very uh, distinct uh, directions. One of them is trying to improve agriculture and then overall just to monitor the environment. 
or the impact of the climate change that may have on various uh, locations or, or in time. So really, most of these uh, informations that we are trying to gather and then process, they have a very strong spatial and temporal component, meaning that um, they are really coming in um, at different time scales, they are coming at different uh, timestamps, and so combinations of these data sets, it's really one of the biggest challenge that needs to be overcome. And in this uh, seminar series, one of my colleagues, Bruce Adam Green, really discussed a pairs platform that we developed. Uh, and uh, I was contributing some of the development of that platform. But nowadays, we are really looking for applications that we can do on the top of this big data. And so we are addressing a variety of uh, topics. Some of them could be, for example, environment, water, and then agricultural space. And all of them has uh, certain challenges or sub themes, you know, where now you can imagine that you take spatial and temporal variations and then you try to extract as much information as you can from uh, from that particular location. And I'm going to give you one example where we really try to apply this one and give you an idea about how can you take informations from, let's say, satellite and from sensors, combine them into a single framework to address a very simple problem. How can we really do, let's say, smart irrigation? In general, um, in places where we do irrigations, it tends to be very uniform, uh, meaning that people are putting the same amount of water in every location on their farm. And in this particular picture that you're going to see on the right side, you're going to see a vineyard where we tested our technology. And it's a snapshot on the top of it that it's coming from satellite imaging. Just looking to that particular image, you're going to see that inside of any of these fields, which are defined by the boundaries, there's a lot of variation. And that variation, it's really coming from the fact that uh, vegetation, it's responding differently in different locations. And the variation, it's coming mainly from the soil properties. So the soil, it's varying, even at the level of a single farm, and that it's reflected in the way in which the plants are growing in that particular location. So in general, if you would, for example, try to maximize the total amount of uh, crop production in a, in a particular field, one aim is to really overcome the spatial variability that you have at the farm level. And that could be achieved either by doing something that is called variable uh, management. That could be applying water differentially, putting more water in locations where the water tend to flow out of the soil very quickly, or apply variable amount of fertilizers so that you would uh, compensate for leaching of the fertilizers through the soil. So in general, in order to overcome some of these problems, you could address the technology by either integrations of infield sensors, or you could utilize some of the aerial imagery from the top, and then look how these changes are happening on the ground and then take decisions on uh, imagery or, or satellite information. And in, in overall, this whole picture is then a very important component. It's going to be integrations of the weather model. Then you integrate all of this data. You run some web analytics on the cloud. Uh, you do some of the calculations. And then once this information is collected, then you are trying to go back to a particular farm and you're trying to adjust an irrigation system or a fertilization system such that the dispensing of various chemicals or uh, water is going to be variable, adapted to the local conditions. So here it's one example, you know, where uh, what you're going to see on the left side, it's really a yield map. Yield map, it's really just how much production you're going to have per certain area. And this particular case, it's going to be uh, grapes. So it's just one of the crops. But this is the case for any other crops that you're going to find out there. It could be corn, it could be soy, or any other thing. If you look across a certain area, you're going to see these huge fluctuations of the total amount that could be collected. And in the, in the case of the vineyard, you know, one of the devices that you're going to see, it's on the right side. So it's this big agricultural uh, tractor, right, that it's going. In the middle, you're going to see that it has these two claps. So they pretty much go and they take the, the wine and they shake it. Uh, that shaking, uh, it's going to take down the, the grapes. And then they have a GPS system. So now they are able to 
measure very precisely the total amount of produced grapes in that particular location. You take that information and then you translate it into this graph, uh, graph that you see on the left side, and you're going to be able to understand which part of a particular vineyard is going to produce more and which one is going to produce less. And as you can see, you know, just from the graph, there it's a variation of a factor of two, right? So you go from like six tons per acre all the way up to 30 tons per acre, just across a 20 acre area. If you have a larger farms, then you can imagine that this fluctuation is going to be uh, very, uh, very large also. So to overcome, right, some of these variations, that's where the technology that we are trying to develop, this variable rate uh, management, is going to play a significant role. These expectations that given that we have, let's say, low yielding areas, what we are trying to achieve is to put differential amount of water or the fertilizer in those particular spots, such that we are trying to push up the total production. And overall, we, we expect that, you know, perhaps, you know, all, both the yield and then the quality may improve in this whole process. So in general, you know, the system that we tested was a drip irrigation system. It's something that it's very uh, widely used in various parts of the world, uh, mainly in California, uh, in Israel. It's a, a country where it's a widely used technology in India, and it's really adopted in various other parts of the globe. The idea is that you have a hose and you can see that, you know, at the bottom of some of the trunks there, that it's like a hose. That particular hose is uh, going to have some punctured holes and water is dripping through those uh, locations. So as the water is dripping, you know, you try to put those holes very close to the trunk of, let's say, the grapes, or you could put it into a various, uh, close to the crops that you are growing. And then you can control by time how much water you're putting on the ground. So given that you keep, let's say, the irrigation system open for 10 minutes or for an hour or a couple hours per, uh, per day, you expect to see that uh, the, the total amount of water that is going there it can be controlled. And so here, the whole uh, idea is to, instead of using uh, continuous irrigations that you would have normally from, from a system like this, where the whole hose is going to be under the same pressure and every single plant seeing the same amount of water, now you can try to separate this one into individual segments so that every single of the grapes, it's going to be controlled individually, such the total amount of water that you put down there, it's going to, to change from one place to another. So really the technology that we are trying to develop here, it's a way in which we can now adjust the total amount of water down to a single uh, crop level, or in this particular case, a wine. So the system that we developed, it's a, a, a wireless sensor network where we have some controllers integrated into the system, and you can see, you know, some of the boxes that has been developed. It has an IBM logo on it. It's really just a, a valve that it's allowing us to put the water on and off into that particular segment of water. And everything is divided into a couple of uh, so-called wines. And then based on the informations that we are collecting from either the weather or from the satellite imagery, now we are able to put differential amount of water and fertilizers. So the type of analytics that it's underlying some of this principle, it's based really on satellite imagery. Uh, and we choose satellite imagery for two purposes. One of them is that it's readily available. And if you look back, for example, from the Landsat, which is a satellite constellations operated by the US Geological Surveys, they provide information for the last 30 years about what it's really, uh, what's happening on the ground. And there is a large amount of effort where people did come up with various indices where they can understand how, for example, uh, vegetation is growing on the ground. So what you see, let's say, on the lower graph, it's really just a snapshot in an area where you can see farms, and then you're going to see the circles that are some of the pivot irrigation systems. And just looking to some of these images uh, in time and in space, you're going to realize that they are indeed a large variations between locations to locations. And that variation, it comes either from the fact that they have different crops that are growing there, or that it's really just different uh, management techniques that they, they integrate. 
So once you have information about what is happening, what type of crops are on the ground and how do they are growing, now you can start to integrate a variety of additional information. And mainly it's going to be an energy balance problem where you're going to consider that given we have solar radiations that is coming from the sun, part of that uh, radiations is going to be reflected back. Uh, that's going to be the, the factor H that you're going to see on the upper right corner. Then some of the uh, energy is going to be absorbed by the soil. And then some of them is going to be uh, dissipated through this evapotranspiration. So this evapotranspiration is the process where water that has been absorbed by a certain crop, now it's going to be consumed and then the plant is just evaporating. The whole analytics here, it's really to compensate this ET, this evapotranspiration by providing the amount of water to that particular crop such that you maintain a certain balance at the plant level. And in general, you know, if you would look to how you could manage this one, you're going to need weather information, you're going to need essentially the satellite information, and then uh, you would combine these two of them and you could run calculations on a very large scale, and then you could translate that particular information to what it's really the amount of water required at individual locations. And as I was pointing out, you know, there's enough spatial variations from farm to farm or within the farm such that now you can start to adjust the requirements at that particular level. So just to give you an idea uh, how we implemented our technology, uh, what you're going to see here is the farm that I was discussing previously. And then we divided this farm into particular squares. So we did not do uh, individual plants, but rather we tried to group uh, roughly around 30 to 40 of the wine particular pixel. And then we acquired the satellite imagery about every single pixel, as, as I described it previously. And this information was coming every 10 days. And then every 10 days we were able to calculate what is the water requirement for that individual pixel. Once we had the information, now we had a control system, as I just described previously, such that we were able to adjust the amount of water that you would put down for that particular pixel. And in this whole process, we were hoping to adjust the whole um, irrigation such that we are balancing the need for that particular pixel location. Obviously, you know, if you would have an input, coming from satellites or some aerial imagery or even some drones that has finer resolutions, then you could create these pixels to go lower and lower until you start to match uh, in particular, uh, let's say, the need of a single plan. And I have some information where I'm going to show you some calculations, what would be the optimal locations and what would be the optimum uh, adjustability for, for these irrigations that may make sense. So just to give you an idea, right, uh, we were running this particular experiment across a couple of years. And uh, what we were trying to prove is that we took 2012 as a so-called baseline. Uh, we had two different uh, areas, one on, one on the top, which is going to be the area where we had the variable rate irrigations adjusted. And then the lower one, which is not really a square shape or a rectangular shape, but rather than distorted forms, same number of pixels that were so-called the control areas. In the control areas, we had uh, uniform irrigation. So that was the best practice that the farmers would take based on the informations that he has. On the top one, we've done the variable rate irrigation. So every single pixel there, it's going to get adjusted for water. And then we are taking these informations year to year. Usually, crops like um, uh, grapes are plants that the, the improvement is going to be able to be observed in a two-year time period. So the first year, it's really just uh, the, the information, it's encoded already in the springtime. And the way that you know the, the previous year uh, rain pattern happened, that is going to determine the yield. If you really want to impact this one, you have to go across two-year period. 
So for every single year, measurements have been taken about the yield in every particular location. And then we were looking for two, info, two pieces of information here. How much it's improving the yield, and the second one, how uniform it's going to become a particular area. So in the, the upper picture, the corner one, which is the 2012, you could see that the lower right corner was blue, you know, that mean that uh, somehow the, the yield was high there. And then the other area on the other corner, which was the upper left, was lower. And then you can see that after two years, you know, things get reversed and we were able to demonstrate that indeed, if you would carry out a variable rate irrigation in this particular system, you can get a 26% increase in the yield on areas that were low yielding areas as we started the experiment and then uh, they changed in these two periods. On the control area where we uniform irrigation was carried out, really we demonstrated that you know uh, things did not change significantly. So it remained as it was previously and you're going to still see you know year to year variability that are encoded into the way that the water is holding some of the, the the soil is holding the water in that particular location. So overall, I think that uh, the the we were able also to track in this particular uh, case even the uh, normalized difference vegetation index. And in this particular uh, in particular experiments, we were able to demonstrate that the uniformity in a way in which we are managing individual plants now could be achieved just by manipulating the water. And again, you know, this is like a continuous stream of images. So you can imagine that you're gonna take the informations year to year, and then you adapt, you adapt, you know, the amount of water that you put on the ground. Uh, so the next question is really, how can we improve, uh, uh, do we really do more than just improvement in the yield? which is a good aspect, but uh, in many parts of the world, water is a limited resource. So what you see here are going to be the individual uh, amount of water, the accumulated water that has been put it down for, for a region. And as you can see, uh, at the end of this whole bar, they are the red and then the yellow one. The yellow one would be uh, really just how much water you would put down if you would have conventional irrigation. While the red one, it's really the total amount that has been put down through this variable rate. So what is really the a message here is that if you implement this type of systems, the total amount of water that you could save through this technology uh, could be potentially 20% less. So you would achieve a uh, much higher yield, so you get almost a 25% 20, uh, increase in the yield while you're putting 20% less water. And so in general, uh, you could uh, obviously translate the total amount of water into another metrics that it's potentially a better indicator. In general, we are talking about water use efficiency. How much certain crops you're gonna grow per gallon or per liter of water. And as you can see uh, on the lower graph here, uh, we demonstrate that you could get a 12% improvement in the water use efficiency. So you're gonna grow the same amount of, uh, of grapes with 12% less uh, water. So overall, um, I think that the message that I wanted to convey is that if you take the right type of uh, combinations of technologies, which requires a wireless sensor network, a control system, and then potentially a satellite-based monitoring of what's happening on the ground, we are able to achieve such type of very promising uh, metrics where we produce more, uh, uh, more uh, grapes, you increase the yield. At the same time, you reduce the total amount of water used to grow that grapes. Now, one of the questions that you know people may ask, um, what is really the most acceptable type of uh, spatial resolutions that you try to address? Uh, essentially, uh, should we really go here at the individual plant level to adjust, let's say, the irrigation? 
or dates like an optimum size where these things uh, may work the best. And dates are trade off, obviously, in this whole problem, which is a balance between how much money you want to spend on technology to adjust irrigations at the individual uh, plant level. And then the second one, it's going to be uh, what is the expected increase in the yield? Certainly, uh, just by applying variable rate uh, management that could be either water or it could be the fertilizers, you're going to be able to increase the yield at a certain level, but then it starts to plateau. And, you know, even if you would uh, try to improve better and better the way that you are adjusting uh, the input variables, there is going to be an optimum point where the things now start to, to just uh, don't uh, pay off. So you could, uh, for example, do some very simple calculations about what would be um, the average yield, you know, based on, let's say, the resolution, in this particular case, the management area uh, lateral dimensions. And on the right part, we have this return on investment, which is really showing you that um, if you're very coarse, uh, let's say at 250 feet, that was going to be, you know, already a, a relatively coarse uh, in, um, input imagery, right? Then the, the return of investment is going to be roughly around three years. As you start to decrease the spatial resolutions and you get close to, let's say, 30 meter uh, or, or 100 feet in this particular case, that's kind of the optimum point where the return of investment that you have to do in order to uh, develop and put in a place the technology, it's gonna be closer to, let's say, two years. If you keep reducing the, uh, the spatial resolution, so you try to go to lower and lower level, then the price of the technology or the control system, it's going to overtake the overall uh, improvement in the yield that you can achieve and then essentially it's just start to increase, you know, um, towards three, four, five years. So in general, you know, the message that I want to convey here is that in this particular uh, locations for this particular crop, it turned out that the best uh, spatial resolution where you need to work and adjust the variability for the system could be potentially roughly around uh, 100 feet. Um, and then you just need to keep in mind that, you know, in these calculations that we've done for the return of investment, you really just considered something very simple, which is an increase in the crop yield. On the top of that one, there's the potential cost of the water that could come into, into the picture. And as it happened in many parts of the world, uh, the amount of money that farmers are paying for the water it's relatively bonding so the incentive for them to save the water it's still not in the place but in a different scenarios where now the water it start to be priced on the consumptions and on a, a fair market uh, prices then some of these curves or some of these calculations may change significantly uh, so this is a moment when I could take a small break and see if anybody has a question. Thank you, Lorenta. Thank you very much. I have not received any questions on the contents, so I would like to ask the attendees if they have any questions to pose. Okay, Samuel has a question. So I'm going to unmute you, Samuel, so you can ask your question directly. Muted. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is, this is a short one. It relates to where he, uh, well, event pointed out that, uh, you know, you could then compensate for leaching uh, of fertilizers by applying more fertilizers. But that won't, won't that create a problem on the groundwater quality uh, in the long run? Thank you. I mean, that's an excellent question, you know. Samuel, please, I'm, I'm going to have to unmute. Samuel, please, I'm, I'm...
Okay, you can. Yeah, I could. I could go on. Uh, I can give the answer, and then maybe we go from there. So, obviously, you know, um, th th that's the challenge. You know, in many of these environmental problems, um, in general, you know, when we are trying to optimize one problem, in this particular case, let's say the yield, or you try to optimize the water usage, usually you don't take into account the other aspects of the problem. So as you were pointing out, you know, some of the groundwater may have to start have issues about some of the uh, fertilizers that end up there. But in general, you know, these very complex models where now you can try to couple, let's say, the information that is happening at the individual farm level and how that affects, let's say, a reservoir. And now try to do this one on a regional scale. That's something that it's not pursued. I think by anybody at this particular moment. Uh, usually you have different communities that are addressing the problems totally independent uh, one of each other. So you would have people who would model, for example, the aquifer and for them, you know, the information it's coming from different data sources and like um, information related to how much fertilizer it's put on the ground, you know, how the fertilizers end up in the groundwater. There are some, you know, um, back of the envelope type of calculations in many cases. They are not fully developed. And in, in general, you know, when they are working, they would not work directly with people who would model what would be the optimum amount of, uh, let's say, fertilizers to increase the yield. So. Overall, I think that the message is that, you know, there are the silos communities where, you know, the informations may uh, go uh, from one to another, but really it's not a, not an integrated framework where people now could understand and run various scenarios to understand that if I want to increase potentially the yield on all of the farms, you know, above a certain aquifer with 20%, what is the long-term impact of that one on the, on the aquifer? or the water quality in various other locations. Thank you. Thank you, Leventa. Samo, does that answer your question? Have you got a follow-on question? Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. It's only that, you know, if uh, because he carried out a uh, rate of return, I mean, assessment. But if you want to look at the cost-benefit analysis of the whole uh program then you realize that you will be solving one small challenge here and then creating a bigger challenge down the line but anyway he has answered me that i mean i think uh, uh, people are still working in, in silos and these are issues which probably have to be uh, looked at at a later stage thank you so yeah. i have um, a small question oh, um, in terms of, of um, a system like the one that you showed, Leventa, on uh, precision irrigation, in cases where it's not feasible um, due to cost to put up um, a wireless sensor network, is it possible to use just satellite uh, land cover information, maybe in combination with uh, climate information, to provide guidance uh, for irrigation? at farm level or maybe even a cohort of farms yes i mean some of this some of these techniques uh, has been implemented so originally when we started our particular platform the pairs that was one of the first applications that we had where we had informations about variability uh, at the farm level as you would read out from a particular uh, satellite uh, uh, spectral product and then in addition to that one, we were having information related to, let's say, um, uh, the weather and the evapotranspiration. So these things could be combined and you could come up with uh, typical uh, recommendations. You know, uh, what it requires in addition to that one, it's really information about a specific crop type. So you really need to be able to recognize what it's in that particular farm. Now that information could come from the satellite it's a relatively challenging if you have small plots uh, or you need some type of uh, field survey where people either voluntarily report or you would be able to detect what they have on, on the field. 
as you know different crops may require some adjustment to a general model that would do a recommendations about the total amount of water to put on the ground. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Sibu. Um, thank you, Levante. I think Samuel, just 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 on your on your question, um, we are talking. Um, uh, Levante, I'm assuming this exercise was done with a, a, a USA wine farm. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I think the agricultural questions in in Africa and the reason why this sort of doing agriculture whilst maintaining some sort of water quality is very important because in, 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 in most of the region you have intensive farming alongside subsist subsistence farming. So you can't, you know, we would re really require that sort of understanding of how a specific farm would fit geographically in, in a broader context in order to, um, you know, use a technology that allow us to improve, for instance, the, 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 the yield in, in that specific farm, but also without creating damage in the surrounding area, especially if you're on, along a river or an area downstream, because a lot of other subsistence farming will be uh, directly affected by it. So that's why that question is very uh, pungent for, for people in, uh, in our region and it would probably require um, more cooperative teams in terms of, you know, really understanding how to create a method that is applicable and takes into context, into content, sorry, different issues that need to be um, addressed. Um, I, I find it nonetheless um, fascinating how you can work on, on such a detail and I'm looking forward to the rest of your presentation. So please carry on. Yeah, I'm going to try to cover that one in the second part of the presentations, but just to add to, to this issue, uh, you know, that has been discussed, our experience was that, uh, in general, you know, if you develop some of the scientific tools that would uh, do some of the predictions about what would be the optimum amount of water or the fertilizer that you want to put it on the ground, and you would go back to, let's say, the farmers and you say, hey, this is, you know, the best estimate that is coming from all these tools that could be the weather information plus the satellite and probably they are the state of the art that you're going to find out that there is an active resistance that you're going to find from these people. Uh, they're going to come and say, well, you know, there is a traditions, you know, from generations to generations in which we manage this particular farm and why would I trust uh, somebody, you know, let's say a scientist coming from New York telling me how to do agriculture. And so there, there's this barrier, right, that needs to be overcome in many cases where uh, the best, best uh, approaches that you could utilize using the technology, you know, how you really convey the message to the farmer and then convince them to utilize these, uh, these informations in, in any cases. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what we've learned that it, it's a real challenge. So let me let me move forward and just um, essentially try to cover the second part, uh, which is really, you know, in many of the systems, right, that we've described previously, uh, obviously we are not fault tolerant uh, in a sense that, you know, uh, satellite imagery, it's going to acquire some information, uh, you're going to do some calculations, uh, there are going to be some observations, but Nevertheless, you know, if you're looking into a variety of inputs that you have for any type of system, there are going to be errors in the measurement, you know, it's going to be error in the estimates or in the models. And so in general, uh, what we are trying to do in many of these things is that if we generate some type of output that could go into a decision support system, uh, that could be either uh, recommendations you are running all of this information through some very simple type of modeling. And so here we are talking about uh, something that is called uh, physical analytics. It's really just some physics-based modeling, or it could be just crop type of modeling, where you have to run some of these numbers to understand if they are within some acceptable bounds that in general, either historically, has been validated for that particular location or you or they are just uh, 
make sense, you know, from the point of view of, let's say, farmers. And so in, in many of these things, you know, there are some very simple models that we try to integrate. It could be some crop uh, growth models that you would have, let's say, from B set, which is like a standard crop models. And then you, you put them in, you analyze, you know, what is the output of the different scenarios, and then you try to understand if it really makes sense with historical trends of how much uh, crop you get there or what would be the yield that you expect. And so there is a variety of uh, information flow that is happening in many of the systems. And in general, right, uh, what we were uh, integrating this one, it's this uh, platform and uh, that it's called the pairs. It's really just a variety of informations, you know, that are uh, put into a big database. And the really uh, distinctive part of that database is the data curation part. So instead of just taking the data and upload it there and then hope that somehow the end user who could be a data scientist or could be an agronomist or could be somebody uh, who would be able to filter out the data and do it on its own, on his own computer after downloading this data, we try to take that type of knowledge and build it into the input pipeline of the system. And we call this one as a data curation. And data curation, it's really just to make sure that everything that is reported in uh, some of these data streams do make sense physically. Uh, they have the same carbon format and then essentially trying to make sure that the data harmonization is happening at that particular uh, layer. And in the process, uh, one of the important aspects that perhaps it's not discussed a lot in the scientific community is really how can you capture as fast as possible the metadata or the information related to that particular measurement. In many cases, people may have data, but the conditions under which has been acquired, uh, how have been processed or not have been processed, you know, it's lost. Or they are in various formats that people may have difficulty of reusing these data sets. If you can create the metadata, and you can create a way in which this information now could be used or reused by a variety of other uh, 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 stakeholders in the system, that's really where now all of a sudden one piece of information or a measurement could be reused across a variety of uh, different, uh, uh, different scenarios or models, or I would say um, people who would uh, try to leverage these data sets. Uh, so in general, you know, uh, that's applying also for uh, information that it's coming from satellite, right? So this could be at the sensor level, it could be potentially at the satellite level. And here again, you know, even if you would think about, let's say, uh, the ability to uh, leverage uh, freely available satellite imagery, if you want to use that one as they are, uh, in general, you know, they have to go through multiple processing. In this processing, it's really about how can you compensate for various atmospheric effects. Those could be water, that could be various pollutants in the air that may distort the signal. And if you want to take decisions on, let's say, a particular satellite imagery, then you have to make sure that you really cleanse it and uniformly adjust it across a certain area using the same uh, type of parameters such that at the end of the day when you're saying yes I monitored my particular crop a week ago and I'm trying to compare with what's happening currently then you have to be able to trust that particular number and so that's kind of a process you know that requires some extensive data pre-processing where you would take the raw data and then you reanalyze it and then make it available and in general, right, what we were trying to do with our particular platform is to make these informations uh, available for the people so that they don't have to go through this uh, data preparation process, but rather than have directly access to information that can be consumed. So in general, right, now you can imagine that, you know, in the future, we are going to have um, informations that we can call, let's say, a single pixel sensor, right? And the single pixel sensors, we are really uh, thinking about 
uh, a satellite imagery that potentially could contain information that it's acquired by the satellite or it could be a pixel that is generated for the ground-based uh, measurement of a variety of sensors. So if you would have a uniform distributions of sensors across uh, a very large areas, you can imagine a way of interpolating the information and then dividing it up into some type of uh, pixel-wise information. And then that particular um, uh, information is combined into a model and these models could be anything uh, from a crop model or the irrigation model or financing you know uh, uh, the way that uh, money lending to the farm so there's a variety of supporting informations and then you can now imagine that you know from this aggregated information you can uh, extract informations about what is the best environmental management what is the best land use for that particular location or agriculture so I'm going to try to give you a couple of examples here, right? And in general, you know, one of the areas where some of the satellites, for example, could play a significant role is really how can you detect from it, let's say, water and water bodies under extreme conditions. So one of the scenarios, right, that people have utilized, it's really how can we detect flooding? And in general, uh, you can imagine um, uh, informations that is coming from let's say uh, satellites right they, it's an extreme weather event and then in this particular case as you can see around some of that red circled areas we are highlighting areas that has been flooded if you have informations about what it's really the uh, particular land utilizations there it's a farm area or it's a bare land or it's just an urban area now all of a sudden you have information about which are those areas that have been flooded in particular locations. And you could track this one, you know, across a year. Uh, obviously, the big challenge here is how to maximize the information that you're extracting for a pixel. In general, when it's an extreme weather, you're going to have clouds. And when you have clouds, then the satellite informations may be limited uh, in, um, in coverage. So the whole idea is how can you eliminate some of the cloudy pixels, but at the same time, extract information that may not be readily available. And so part of this one is to use some combinations of optical satellites. Optical satellites are just looking to the imagery as it is, as you would see in a normal picture, or you could take this one uh, into a synthetic aperture radar. That's a different type of satellite that it's uh, operational nowadays. Uh, the European Space Agency has a free product and what it's doing there you have like a, a radio frequency signal operating at roughly around 2.6 gigahertz and then you can take that information and you look for areas you know what what it's really uh, get flooded and extract this information and as you can see you know these are just uh, two examples of flooding events where now we are using the mask and we are trying to identify areas that have in particular, let's say water, no water. And you could see how it is changing, you know, for before or after, let's say a flooding event. And this is another input that you could utilize for, for your uh, system. Uh, it's just another example, you know, so it's really a, a variety. And here now, now we can start to combine two layers so what you're going to see on the right side is going to be the pre-event on the right side you're going to see after the event and then we have the land utilization and so in this particular case now we start to combine informations about what is really the water extent what are really the flooded areas and what are really you know the the different land use patterns there so that we can now understand which areas has been uh, flooded or not uh, one thing that I want to point out is that in this whole process, when we started to look into uh, detecting water from some of the satellites, as you can see in this area where we have these blue patches, and those blue patches are really, you know, the way that uh, the water is flowing. If you look carefully within those areas that it's really the dark blue, you're going to see some little swirls. And those little swirls, you know, are really uh, informations that you could pick up from the satellite 
about events or some type of processes that are happening within that particular um, uh, water body. And in general, they look like uh, somehow you try to mix, uh, let's say, milk with the water, so you have this milky way of things. And so we got kind of puzzled by these informations and we start thinking about what kind of uh, uh, physical phenomena may potentially uh, generate such information. And then we realized that indeed, you know, in many cases, the satellite may be one way in which you could start to understand information about the turbidity, or turbidity would be just uh, how clear is that particular body water in a, in a certain location. So we verified this one. Uh, this is just a river. Uh, and you could take a sensor and then start to take some individual measurements. And if you have information about, let's say, uh, what it's really the, the land use and what would be the potential um, uh, impact, as has been pointed out by the gentleman previously. So you have, let's say, the agricultural runoff and how they are ending up into this particular body water then you could start to monitor this aspect. Now, obviously, you know, the best approach would be here if you would have a large amount of these sensors and you could put as many sensors as you can across this uh, river body and then pick up the information at every location. And if you have a dense enough sensors, then you could create some very significant maps. But the other approach is to use some of the satellite information and you look into a variety of um, uh, spectral bands that may be sensitive to some of the informations. And those informations could be, for example, chlorophyll, usually very easy to detect from, let's say, the satellite. It could be the turbidity or could be a variety of other phenomena. And if you would carry out such a process, you know, so what I want to show you here is now take the satellite information, combine it with the information that is coming from the sensor, and then start to look into these variations or patterns that you would see there. And so what you see in, the, in this particular example now is the satellite information processed for a particular piece of the water body. And you could see now how does that thing is changing across a year period. And if you have enough of some of these uh, some of these uh, measurements, then we could potentially create uh, some of these maps such that uh, they may they may be able to uh, better monitor, for example, the organic matter or the chlorophyll in that particular body of water. And so, in general, the message is that. Uh, while the information that you acquiring from the satellite may not be very specific toward a particular type of measurement, uh, as you would not expect, for example, to measure pH of the water or other chemical characteristics, nevertheless, they are a proxy in order to understand how the variations that you detect from the satellite may correlate with the local measurement. And if you calibrate your model, based on one or two or multiple of the sensors that you may afford to put out there. Now you could use some of these satellite observations to essentially track, you know, these changes across very large areas and really interpolate the informations for parts of the river where potentially you don't have sensors such that you have the possibility of monitoring across very large uh, geographical areas and then extract that particular information that it's of interest for you. So in general, you know, that's kind of uh, the, the uh, conclusions of these presentations, but um, the idea is that having some of this uh, remote sensing plus the sensors and the AI, really they are complementing each other. And if you know how to combine them or leverage one against each other, then you're able to track uh, physical phenomena, you know, that I would say uh, either the utilizations of the water or water quality across very large um, uh, areas. And many of these informations then 
needs to go through some type of validations that could be some uh, physics-based models, I would say, or crop-based models, but nevertheless something that is anchored in the reality such that this large amount of data now could be really processed. And what we think is that, you know, in the future, if you really want to achieve the type of, um, let's say, um, control or yields, or it could be water savings, really the automation is the key here. How can we really develop some of these very simple tools based on either modeling or ways in which we are leveraging these remote informations such that we can offer a baseline information that could be implemented in a certain location such that we are trying to bring the operations of some of these farms or the way that we are managing the water uniformly across very large area making sure that everybody is playing fair in the field. Thank you so much. Thank you very much Levinta. That was a very very interesting presentation and I I actually have a comment from one of our participants who um, you know, triggers a question in my mind. Um, I don't know, Steve, if I can give you the word and you can maybe um, put your comment across to um, to Levente and then that will initiate a conversation around also the size. You just mentioned Levente now, if, you know, if we can make this available for larger chunks of land, maybe we could look at our different um farming areas actually interact with each other and and create a, a system that is able to manage it as a whole and not just one farm to the next so steve i'm going to give you the word um for you to express your comments and you think okay um thanks very much for that presentation it, it's very exciting to see how we can access information for farmers um, to be making better decisions. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the question I raised was, well, one, I would love a copy of the presentation because we're working with um, some organizations to develop these tools for um, large geographic areas. For example, an area below a dam that is feeding um, 100,000 hectares of irrigatable land. Um, if we can um, help those farmers do the right thing there, it, it would be great um, and help them and, and even try and incentivize um, changing practices um, by linking them or, or facilitating linkages, et cetera. But this is, this is it's good to see um, that other people are also thinking about using these systems. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, my, my take on this one is that, uh, you know, I'm not in an agricultural field, but all I'm saying is that right now, there it's a huge amount of untapped information that it's readily available out there. So if you, I, I don't think that right now the, the impediment here is the amount of data or the information that we can extract from the data. I think the, the real challenge is about how can we translate that data into information and then really make it readily available to, to the people who could use it in a simple way. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, they, there are different levels, you know, so my presentations were aimed more towards the scientific community. But for a sim simple farmer, right, the information for him would be as simple as probably a text message saying, you need to put that amount of water down, right? in these particular locations, simply conveyed, right, so that he could really understand and then take action on it. Uh, so that's uh, that's really, I think, the part where uh, probably going to have the highest impact. The science, you know, and the ability to analyze some of this data has been done for a long time. As I was pointing out, you know, uh, USGS, it's operating uh, the Landsat satellite for the last 30 years. Uh, it's out there. Uh, they had some fundamental studies where they demonstrated, you know, how can you use that information to improve the irrigations. Um, I would say that they had partial success, you know, still, even in the US, if you would look to various surveys and you would ask, how do you take the decisions about let's say, uh, 
when to irrigate or how much to irrigate, uh, most of the farmers are going to say that I'm looking up into one of these uh, agricultural almanac, you know, and I'm reading it out there. And even more surprising, probably 10 or 15 percent in the U.S., they are still going to report that they start to irrigate when their neighbors start to irrigate. So I think that's uh, where, you know, I think information made it uh, readily available to them in a form that they can easily consume could be potentially the big winner in this game. Yeah, I agree with that, especially because if I look at uh, some of the subsistence farmers that I've been working with over the years, uh, you know, th th I remember them saying to me that they've noticed that, that they still plant according to the traditional calendar. So not so much when the neighbors plant, but according to how they've been used to traditionally um, handle their, their crops. But uh, they continue to do so, even though they notice that there has been a shift in climate. And recently, and Steve, maybe you, you can add to that, um, in the Limpopo River Valley, um, which is the main river um, you know, across South Africa and to Mozambique, well, Botswana, South Africa and to Mozambique, across Zimbabwe, is that um, those farm, those subsistence farmers who have planted according, watching the weather changes as they sense them on the ground. Of course, they don't have access to remote sensing, but they monitor the weather and they plant accordingly. Instead of planting to the, according to the traditional calendar, have been way more successful than those that have planted according to the traditional calendar. Um, so to have something like this um, happening and then the message, the information, like you say, communicated in a very simple way to say, look, this is the time, uh, this is what needs to be happening and, and let the, the, the farmers do um, according to a sort of more intelligent uh, system that can analyze all the different variables and, and give um, solutions for it to be even um, more productive probably better for water usage as well, considering that we don't have that much. Samuel? Uh... Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. You need the early adapters, right, who would really just, uh, you know, adapt the technology and then they're going to say, this is really what we really need. Yeah. Steve, I'm going to give you the word as well, because you just put a message to say that you are doing uh, apps. Um, and can you just tell us maybe what kind of apps have you been looking at or using at the moment for the for your work in the in Purple Valley? So, uh, thank you. So, um, we're working with Solidary Dad, who are using information and have got apps at the moment. Um, and they're working with exactly as you're saying, giving farmers advice when to plant. Um, and we're, we're also working with the, the national departments dealing with hydrology and, um, and weather predictions and climate to make sure that they're also part of an, a system. Um, so it's what this has done for me, it's reinforced that we're doing the right thing, that the information is there. If we can make it available uh, very easily at a low cost via the, the cell phone system um, to the farmers, that'd be great. We can also give them information about um, uh, the prices at the market and those kinds of uh, issues, um, advice um, using the same system. And um, something like this will add real value to those farmers on the ground. So, so thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Steve. Are there any other questions or comments from other members of the audience before we close the session? No? Sibu, would you like to say? A few words before we close, since this is the last session for the IVM SWP seminars. Thank you, Clara. I think we've had um, quite um, interesting talks over the past six weeks, um, kicking off with just giving, you know, the basics around uh, machine learning, um, the different techniques. And then obviously moving on to the big focus areas, which has been mainly around the spatial data, um, starting off with pairs and now concluding uh, with the examples that we've seen here. Um, and then we also had another section where we talked about um, blockchain. So I think in terms of um, giving the community sort of like um, 
a flavor or a taste of 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 what is really um out there and what is possible at this current moment um to help in in, in better managing our water resources um i think um, the sessions that we've had have been quite useful and I think they've generated um, useful um, discussions because I also remember from last week we had uh, Rodolfo presenting and um, again there was a question um, around um, or was it an earlier before that but there was a question around um, a monitoring of water quality especially in, in, in water bodies and I know that especially in terms of the availability of data the water quality data, um, we, it's quite, um, it's, it's perhaps not um, as abundant as one would, would like it. And it's quite an, an, an issue from a public, public health perspective, as well as from the agricultural perspective. So I hope that through these talks, we can start to have conversations um, as a community about, you know, um, ideas that we can um, take forward um, in collaboration and let's let let's take it um from there obviously clara you will be our main focal point um with people reaching out to you to to, to get people's contact details and so forth um these seminars as, as clara said would be available at um at a, um soon i hope at a later stage through um the channel the the, the partnership youtube channel but as well as through an IBM YouTube channel. And I thank you very much, Leventa, for what has been a very insightful uh, presentation. And um, thank you, Clara, for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Sibu, for attending all of them. Uh, thank you, Levanta, for today. And yes, we're going to say goodbye for now. Whilst we are preparing, just so that you all know, another, the final set of seminars for this year, which is done in collaboration with the IUCN water sector. Uh, on transboundary water governance. So you will receive the invitation for those seminars as soon as the contents are ready. They'll probably roll out a bit later than expected, probably um, late May, beginning of June. Um, so thank you very much for everybody who made the time today. And also most of you have been accompanying us in this entire journey. Um, thank you for IBM for giving us a glimpse of what what is within the IBM research field, um, which I'm sure for me was much unknown up until six weeks ago. So uh, thank you very much for that. And we look forward to collaborating with you and for bringing more solutions to Southern Africa.